You know, you can't go a single day without spotting someone from the younger generation rocking a Nirvana shirt. So, what did they do so right to make sure their legacy never fades away? Of course, no one knows how long Nirvana will stay on top, but industry experts seem to agree the Seattle sound is here to stay. In other terms, what did Nirvana do better than every other grunge band in the past 30 years? I don't know if you've heard about this or not, but Nirvana has displaced Michael Jackson. It's the number one album. Well, to answer that, there are a bunch of factors that played into their massive success. Some were direct, others were just lucky breaks. So stick around and let's find out. Hey everyone, did you know that 97.1% of our viewers aren't subscribed? That's just crazy, right? We're asking for a small favor. If you enjoy our content, please hit that subscribe button and ring the bell so we can keep bringing you more amazing videos. To keep bringing you great content despite demonetization, join us on Patreon and be a part of our journey. Now let's get started. Let's talk about one of the key undeniable factors, Nirvana's unique sound. This wasn't a random development. It was a calculated choice. Kurt Cobain embraced the quiet, loud, quiet, loud dynamic to create the ultimate pop song, as he described it himself. Later on, he openly admitted to ripping off this technique from the Pixies. He even named a song Verse Chorus Verse after this method. Kurt Cobain didn't write songs based on musical theory, he just went with what felt and sounded right. I, you know, I have no concept of, of, of knowing how to be a musician at all whatsoever. I mean, I don't know the names of chords to play. I don't know how to do major and minor chords on a guitar at all. I mean, I couldn't even pass, you know, guitar 101, folk guitar 101, you know. I have no desire to... Um, to um, become any better of a guitar player. I just don't, I'm, I'm not into musicianship at all. I don't, I don't have any respect for it. I just hate it, you know? To learn how to read music or to understand arpeggios and Dorian modes and all that stuff, it's just a waste of time. It's just, it just, you know, it gets in the way of originality. If you check out Rick Beato, he explains how Nirvana's sound is almost perfect in its compositional structure. Beato uses theory to break down why their music feels and sounds so right. Absolutely stunning. This is the thing that I, why I harp on Nirvana so much, why I've always harped on Nirvana. The perfection of the lines, that the, that the melodic lines are so perfectly written. He had a natural ear for how phrases should get put together. He may or may not have understood all the theory and methodology, but he brought it forth in his chord structures. Kurt had this uncanny ability to hear notes outside the basic power chords and use them in his melodies. These notes, often associated with jazz and classical genres, brought a layer of complexity to his simple yet impactful songwriting style. So you might be wondering, what did Nirvana do right sound-wise? Well, Kurt had this knack for creating catchy melodies that felt almost like pop songs but he wrapped them in the rough sound of his guitar and his raw vocals. Plus, he really paid attention to song structure and timing. His lyrics were poetic, yet simple, drawing from both punk and folk, and they really spoke to the struggles of modern American youth. You don't sell that many albums without resonating with your audience. Before grunge became a thing, it was known as blue-collar punk. These bands were poor, from tough towns, living hard lives. And this background played a huge role in shaping their music, even more than many might think. And in the 1990s, there were tons of articles about the Seattle sound, but no two bands really sounded the same. Pearl Jam leaned towards straight-ahead rock and roll, while Alice in Chains went for the heavy metal vibe. Nirvana, though, they had their roots deep in punk rock music. When talking about what made punk appealing, Kurt defined it as freedom, liking, and accepting anything you like, playing whatever you want, as sloppy as you want, as long as it's good and has passion. I was going, um, I was commuting back and forth between Aberdeen and Montesano. I was living in Aberdeen, and I was um, 
going to school in Montesano, which is about 30 miles away. I had buzz in a couple of classes. I had him in an art class and an electronics class, and I remember just uh, hanging out with him and just, uh, he had a few punk rock magazines, and I would look at them just like, oh. I was just mesmerized, you know, I was just like, oh God, what would that sound like? And that issue of Cream Magazine when they were following the Sex Pistols tour, you know, in 78, you know, I, was just, I remember seeing that picture of Sid Vicious and just going, oh wow, that's real rock and roll, it has to be, look at the butt on his face, you know? This need for freedom also influenced the band's name. After considering names like Fecal Matter and Pen Cap Chew, Kurt chose Nirvana because it means freedom from pain, suffering, and the external world, and that's pretty close to my definition of punk rock. Later on, Dave Grohl backed up Kurt's view by telling Lars Ulrich from Metallica that all you really needed to play punk rock was a song and a big heart. I thought was so cool about the punk rock scene when I was young was that there was this underground network that was run by kids. There were people making fanzines and people trading tapes and people with record companies that didn't even have their driver's license yet. Like there was this real sense of independence and that anything was possible. I'm gonna do whatever I want to do. Punk always had popular aspirations dating back to the Ramones. It's almost strange that punk didn't produce bigger acts in the US before Nirvana, given how simple and catchy punk music could be. Maybe the music industry was put off by the negative energy in punk music. But Nirvana found the perfect formula by mixing pop with a punk sound, which made them stand out in the Seattle scene. You can really hear this, especially in their debut album Bleach, which is often cited for its strong punk influence. But even though Nirvana had the credentials to be an underground band, Kurt always came back to those catchy hooks that excited him as a kid. Kurt was like, he was counterculture, but then he also really wanted to be really famous. Whether we like to admit it or not, people often focus on the looks and stage presence of a band's frontman, since he's usually the most visible member. Singers who are shy or lack confidence can struggle to win over the crowd, even if they have the vocal chops. A band's image and aesthetic are often shaped by their lead singer's look and attitude. In Kurt's case, his appearance definitely played to his advantage. He was good looking, but unaware of it, and wasn't full of himself. In fact, this was also confirmed by his friend Buzz Osborne from the Melvins, even though he was a bit salty about it. Dale or I had the, uh, what I like to call the MTV wounded junkie look that seemed to be so, seems to be so popular with, with those kinds of people, because I honestly believe if Kurt Cobain would have looked like uh, 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 Fat Albert, nobody would have given a shit about him or his music. Another thing that added to his aura is that Kurt avoided rock star cliches and didn't take himself too seriously. We can't explain ourselves. We don't, we don't consciously think about our music, so we can't explain it. Therefore, interviews are worthless. Let's go. <laughs> he knew how to work the media, often expressing controversial opinions. In an interview with Flipside in 1992, he expressed his frustration with Pearl Jam and Alice in Chains that he believed were merely adopting the grunge aesthetic for commercial gain, stating, Those bands have been in the hairspray cock rock scene for years, and all of a sudden they stop washing their hair and start wearing flannel shirts. It doesn't make any sense to me. There are bands moving from LA and all over to Seattle, and then claim they've lived there all their life so they can get record deals. It really offends me. While he initially desired to be a successful musician, he grew increasingly uncomfortable with the pressures and expectations that came with it. He famously stated that he didn't want to be a spokesperson for a generation, feeling out of touch with his audience and burdened by the role of a rock star. His suicide note reflected a deep-seated guilt and disillusionment with the music industry and his own success, indicating that he had lost excitement in creating music and felt disconnected from the adoration that many rock stars thrive on. Another cool and selfless thing about Kurt was how he supported bands he liked, no matter how big Nirvana got. They were amazing at promoting other contemporary bands, ensuring their friends also had a shot at success. Take the Meat Puppets, for example. Kurt was a huge fan and wanted to support them. 
He used the high-profile Unplugged platform to expose the Meat Puppets to a wider audience, inviting them to join Nirvana on stage. Even though MTV wasn't too thrilled about it, when the producer announced that Nirvana requested some guests, MTV's eyes lit up. They expected big names like Eddie Vedder or Tori Amos. But when they found out it was the Meat Puppets, they were disappointed. In a chat back in 2014, Kurt Kirkwood from the Meat Puppets recalled how they heard MTV wanted more famous bands, making them feel like they had somehow snuck in. Let's talk about Nirvana's abrupt end. Now, a lot of frontmen have died, and their bands died with them. This isn't something new, but Nirvana did it differently. They burned out instead of fading away. Their time was so short, and Kurt died so young, that they'll be iconic forever. It's a common thread among those in the 27 Club. It's morbid, but some say Kurt died at the perfect moment in grunge history, right at the zenith of the Seattle movement. And this forever cemented Nirvana's legacy. Dying young, under mysterious circumstances, and at the height of his career, all contributed to the lasting notoriety Nirvana still has today. Don't get me wrong, it would have been far better if he hadn't done that. But I think that one of the factors that truly catapulted them into the long-term fame they've enjoyed ever since. So, what do you think made them stand out? Do you think Nirvana could have gone on like Alice in Chains tried to after Lane Staley's loss? Let us know in the comments below. We love reading your analyses. And if you've made it this far, mark your presence by liking the video and please subscribe as it encourages us to make more videos. Thank you and see you in our next one.